Sonia? Yeah. What did you guys tell him? Um, we're live. Did you guys lose the night? Oh, and then tell him to take photos. Why would they have a press camera? Um, we have a Wednesday night from Shen Chen. Have you ever been? Have you ever been to Shen Chen? My 50 trips to China and Canada. Yeah, it's really big. But it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's I crazy. was the only American in the Huawei headquarters the day before Trump uh, decided said, to said nobody destroy them. Yeah. Um, boy, I can't impress this company. Yeah. Um, it's worth a 10 cent, I think. Yeah, it's it's another worth, impressive company. Yeah, it's worth, um, it's the wrong place to put it, like Foxconn or some old very general ones. Yeah, it's crazy. It's very nice yeah, wide. That's who, uh, yeah. so he's right. DJI, the drone company. Yeah, so the first time I went to Shenzhen was like 12 years ago, and it was kind of like a crazy impressive yeah. event. Yeah. But now it's just like, it's like can't even imagine. It's just like I, I noticed when you come through. Wow. Yeah, are they are they camera one, camera two? They are. Uh, I think I think it's America. Oh, so camera yeah. one, biggest stage. Well, we understand yeah. the ambition, the energy. Yeah, yeah. So the camera two right now is the activity. So it's it's confidence. Who's camera two? Yeah, no, it's big. No, it's like every day matters. Two, two little days.
for sound check on both of us. I'm, we're both sort of uh, mild mannered people. That's true. <laughs> well, he's not, the voice We're not coming. bellowing. It's coming in nice. We don't it's, bellow. It's coming well. Yeah. What time do you have? Well, as much time as you need. No, but what time? It's, it's, it's right on the number. Yeah. Is, is there anything to give people notice? You are unmuted. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Mike Moe, founder of GSV, and it's uh, my true pleasure and privilege to have the opportunity, opportunity this afternoon to uh, have a conversation with, with Rick Levin, who was the president of Yale University for 20 years, and then after that very distinguished career, um, went, came to Coursera after it was a couple years old and really uh, was able to take what was a very big idea but made a real business of it. And so, um, and we're, we're talking about Coursera Day. So first, Rick, when you look at, um, you know, why did you, you know, after 20 years at Yale, and, you know, one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious academic institutions in the world, um, what, why did you decide to come to Silicon Valley and uh, and, and become CEO of Coursera. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks for having me uh, uh, talk to your community here. I'm, um, it, it, it wasn't quite like I left looking for this. I took a sabbatical right after I finished as president of Yale. I was sort of camped out at Stanford when uh, the opportunity arose, and John Doerr of, of Kleiner Perkins sort of came after me to, to think about this option. But it was a natural question to ask because I've, but even at Yale, I'd been a big advocate for moving forward on, on online education because I thought it offered great potential for the world's top universities to reach out and broaden their communities. And, you know, so, so for me, it was we had, and we had done quite a bit of, uh, of that at Yale in the form of putting a lot of um, existing courses that were just captured in the classroom on film and put online for free. Uh, and got and it got a lot of uptake, a lot of users, and and we could see the potential was uh, uh, to do something more systematic and more focused on you know uh, on on reaching people um, in a meaningful way, you know, not as a consumption good, but actually as an investment good for people. That they, that that would that, that that had a lot of potential, and so I was I was taken by it. I was taken by the Coursera founders. I thought they had great a great idea, and it produced from very high quality. Content very in the first couple of years, and so uh, I signed up. I'm glad I did. Well, uh, I think as a shareholder of Coursera from almost the beginning, I'm very glad you signed up as well. <laughs> right. Thank you. But after so f after four years of being CEO of Coursera, you decided to step down. Yeah. What was sort of what was Sixty, I guess, almost sixty-seven years old when I started. I was sixty-seven years old when I started, and the thought was, you know, sort of three, three and a half years might be plenty, uh, given that the company were to go public in five, six years down the road. I might be a little, a little, you know, long in the tooth to be leading an IPO and promising investors that I'd be around for another decade. So, uh, so the thought was, I would transition as I had. But, but to pass the leadership on to a younger person. And it's worked out very well. I, I'm a senior advisor to the new CEO. I, I spend an hour a week talking with him. Um, I, of course, the university, the company still has, you know, my involvement and, uh, and, and my, you know, uses maybe 10, 15 percent of my time. Uh, to of course, Sarah, in, in my view, and I think just factually, 
is creating the world's learning platform with 40 million students uh, on the platform, 160 universities. When you look at, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges for online learning, and what do you see as the greatest opportunities? Well, there, there, there are, well first the opportunities are enormous. I mean, I, because it, it's, it's a, this is a scalable way to reach you know, tens of, and eventually hundreds of millions of people at very low cost relative to what people pay for live education in their classroom, which is not scalable and, and which, and which uh, um, is very high cost. So, so it Think about entering university all the way through to their first job, moving up their job, uh, all the way through to give them to continue to learn and grow after they retire. Basically, every type of need could be satisfied, educational need could be satisfied at, 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 at you know, low cost.
jobs and yes areas. yes absolutely we we one of the new things we've introduced for our you know we we of course now market not just B two C but also to enterprises so we we have uh, over seventy Fortune five hundred companies now using Coursera courses and their job training. And one of the things we've recently developed is this global skills indexing capability where we use the huge pool of information on our platform because we have all these people who've taken courses, um, and many of them from different corporate email addresses. And so we can go in and say to an IBM, here's how your um, employees stack up on all of these skills. And you know, there's a whole, you might list 50 different skills. Here, here's how your employees do relative to all the people in the world that have taken these courses, or relative to all the people in your industry that have taken these courses. And companies really love this. They well, it's super really powerful, right? Yeah. I mean, right. And, 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 and we're, and we're Coursera, right. because of 40 million students, because of the number of, right. uh, you know, thousands of corporations now that are using Coursera, yeah. I mean, the information, the insights that we're able to get are gonna be on parallel. I totally think so. I mean, I think that they were, I think we're seeing that. Talk yeah. about free, because you know a lot of people talk about you know something's valuable, you should pay for it. Everything was free. When I got in, you know, the consequence was we had already, you know, a couple hundred courses on the platform and and virtually no revenue <laughs> because all we were charging for was a piece of paper, a version of which you could also get by taking the course for free. So it wasn't that we. So part of the initial job was to actually create something valuable behind the paywall so that there'd be incentive for people to to become paid users and. And what the key there was basically putting assessment behind the paywall so that people could, all they can do, all you can do now for free is watch the videos. You can't take tests, you can't, you can't uh, get your get graded, um, and you can't get a certificate, um, a sort of credential. Um, but the free is still very important because it gets us eyeballs and it gets us, and, met, and what we find is, um, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it helps the you know, the, the virality of the platform, it helps right. people, word, word of mouth spreads. And many, many free users, may, they may take a number of courses uh, for free and, and, then, and then decide to commit to something. And maybe even commit to a degree program from having never paid for a course before. So we, so we do, it, it's, it's, it's valuable. And um, another thing it provides us with is by having this large base of, of of users is when we went into the more highly valued business of offering online degrees, we have an inherent advantage in that field because um, our customer acquisition cost is so much lower than other people. With 40 million email addresses, we, 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 we don't have to buy Facebook, targeted Facebook ads right. at an expensive price. We can just, we can just um, mail, I mean, we, we've done the great majority of our marketing and recruitment of degree students through this unpaid channel, just sending emails to our user base. Which really is part of the secret sauce of how, in terms of a model, right. it's so difficult to compete against. Because if you look at most online or just traditional universities, the marketing cost or how much it costs to take in a student is very, very high. 20 to 30 percent of revenue often. With, yeah. with Coursera, it's yeah. basically non-existent. That's right. And that's and so I think people don't understand. I mean, that part is so critical. It's really valuable. And the other thing about free, it's pretty hard to underprice it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so as you look at the different strategies and competitive advantages, right. well, nobody's gonna, you know, it's, yeah. it's it's and we're and we're making use of this by convincing our university partners that without those extra acquisition costs, they should charge less for their programs. And you know, of course, the actual cost of serving students, because you don't have to have one professor in a classroom for each thirty students. Is is much lower, and so all of our degrees are priced. At, I agree with that. Talk yeah. about so you, you you go go deeper in terms of how free builds up into an economic model with certificates and business yeah. and degrees. 
and how that all works together to kind of create yeah. this very robust economic model. Well, we we think we invented the phrase stackable credentials. I'm not sure I, there are other claimants, but 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 early on we sort of realized that that there's there's kind of a progression. There's the free browser, if you will, the people that s sign up for a course, watch some of the videos, don't complete typically. I mean, you know, the early days we were many people were were, were nervous about Coursera's future because they thought what is this, only 7% or 3% or 5% of people in this course actually complete it. But, they were, but most of the people were just browsing and taking what they wanted from it. You know, once you started introducing pay for a course, that involved a certain degree of commitment. So what you found was once people paid, 50, 60% will, would go on to complete the course. Then we, took, then we took a next step back in about 2014, just when I started, uh, of stacking individual courses together into programs, we call them specializations, that are four to, to nine courses long, that, that give you essentially a higher level, a broader competency, a, higher, a, a larger aggregation of skills. And those are, those are still very reasonably priced, you know, in the five, four to six, seven hundred dollar range typically for a specialization that might take you four or five months to complete. Um, and then once we had specializations in place, that's when we went to universities and started to think about how about building on those and, and you know, just as a specialization stacks up a number of courses, how about degrees that are, that are stacks of specializations that might have six or eight specializations as its components? And, you could, and then if you're at the University of Illinois, which is our first degree program, you can offer eight, I think maybe there's now ten, specializations. They could be freestanding. People could take those. They could take the individual courses if they wanted. They could take the, the, the stacked up specialization. Or then they could take a specialization and if they really liked it and got a lot out of it, they could apply to the degree program after they completed it. So it, it, it gave us a huge amount of flexibility. It gave learners flexibility about how much, what level do you want to go to. But each level was like a marketing tool for the next level. Right. So I do a course. Wow, that was interesting. I, I, I should do, go deeper in this field, so I'll take the specialization. I do the specialization in digital marketing and say, gee, I think I'll take an MBA because they've got all these other interesting you know, specializations. And so I think it's, it's worked quite effectively, this idea of stackable credentials. So, so it, it's been great. Yeah. Um, talk about, so recently, University of Pennsylvania announced a partnership with Coursera being the first Ivy League school to have online. Right. Not the last. Not the <laughs> well, you haven't been a former Ivy League president. Right. What's going on? I mean, that's you know, part of that whole is, is sort of the exclusivity, the lead right. in a positive way. How, how do you, you know, how did, why do you think University of Pennsylvania did this, and why won't it be the last? Yeah, uh, I think we were we were very fortunate in that a couple of years earlier, they, several years earlier, they had designed this master's program that was really. Kind of unique. It was. It's a. Com, it's a computer science master's degree for people that have had no previous computer science, or or at least or very little. People that that aren't computer science majors. It's called computer and information technology, and it had a natural market, which is lots of people that go to university and specialize in something else. Um, they might. It might be. It might be humanities. It might be some course courses that don't lead. To, to careers very naturally. Or it might be a science, it might be chemistry majors, where the people decide, well, I'm a chemistry major, I don't really want to be a chemist, so what do I do with a chemistry major? Right. And, and so a lot of these people, you know, they might have picked up a little coding, they might have taken a crash course somewhere to, to learn a programming language, they like computers, and they, and they think, well, I can't, what do, how do I go on in that field? This is a perfect entree, because it assumes no prerequisites, and it takes you through to, uh, to a level where you can get employed as, 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 uh, uh, as someone who knows some computer science. And so it, it, was, it, it had a natural appeal, a kind of broad-based appeal. And of course, the on-campus program was more popular than they anticipated. And, they only had, and it's, of course, compared to an online program, an inefficient way to teach this, because computer science in particular is probably the most, it's probably the field that's the easiest to teach without live interaction. And, and so um, they got bold and decided this is the ideal candidate for, for our first 
you know, step into the online degree. It also they didn't have a franchise to defend. It was a new program. It was kind of an experiment. It was in a, it was not it was not the MBA at Wharton. They're not going to take that one online anytime soon because that's a really high value franchise. But uh, you know, from it, from their sense, it, it was a good strategic play. I've been trying to convince my colleagues at Yale to do something similar in a couple of ideas I have about fields that are that are also not well-established fields and where you don't have a lot of reputation to, to um, potentially put at risk by offering a lower-priced alternative to the, to the, on, to the live the version. So Coursera for Business yep. was a new initiative that you launched and brought in Nikhil Sinha, who's now yep. the Working CEO of GSV Labs and right. part of the GSV team. Right. Um, talk about how that came about, and, and obviously your Rolodex from Yale was enormous in terms of CEOs. Right. So how did how did how did this uh, how did that come to be? And, and talk about some of the momentum that's in that business today. Well, I have to say, the Coursera for Enterprise, the, the germination of it was um, was was starting just as I got there, um, not from top down, but more from in the trenches. We had a business development team led by Julia Stiglitz, who now also works for GSV Accelerate. Um, That's the training uh, ground for GSV. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and some of the members of her team, just the, the idea was, go around and get companies to know about us. We weren't yet, we weren't yet thinking we would open up a corporate training you know, a line of business. But we wanted, at that point, we were going to companies seeking their endorsement. You know, have, have your chief learning officer take a look at these courses, and see if it, will you give us a quote? You know, will you will you will you say that you you like this material? It's useful, or will you will you would you be willing to say uh, that it's some, you know something you would hire to that people with this certification would would be useful, or, or would you sponsor um, uh, a project in a course that that might uh, that, that might use some of your internal tools and kind of good marketing play for you? So we were doing some business development with companies. And as we did that, we started to we 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 started to realize they might have internal training needs. And then we looked at our database and discovered, you know, fifty-five thousand people with Amazon.com email addresses had signed up for Coursera courses, or you know, thirty thousand from Microsoft. Or big numbers, you know, had, were actually using our courses already. And th that was that was uh, around the end of 2015, and we were at that moment thinking, okay, we've done courses, we've done specializations, what are going to be the big initiatives for the next three years? And it was at that moment, sort of second half of 2015, that we decided the best candidates are two. Uh, one is, is, a, is a channel extension going from B2C to, to B2B and offering corporate training. And the other was a product extension up to degrees, from specializations to degrees. So we made those decisions pretty much simultaneously in the last half of 2015, and then launched the efforts more full scale the next year. And I, they, they both done remarkably well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So talk about the geographical reach of Coursera. I mean, it's interesting because I can't think of many businesses started in Silicon Valley that have kind of got the geographic coverage, if you will, as quickly as Coursera. Global from day one. That is the astonishing thing. It's so different from most Silicon Valley companies. Uh, uh, the, uh, the initial courses by Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler you know, already had more than 50% of the users from overseas. And today, it's, it's something like 78% of the user base. I might be, be right on that right. number. I think yeah. that's still right. 78% of the users are, are international. Um, uh, and more than half of the payers are international. So that's uh, you know, qu uh, quite different and quite remarkable, and particularly since the bulk of our content is in English. Now, we do have pretty extensive Spanish language content now to reach Latin America, and some of our Latin American partners have done a great job in producing um, content for that market. Um, and to a lesser extent, Chinese, Chinese and, and uh, um, and a certain amount of French and Russian content, but um, and that that will grow. Uh, the the, the foreign, I think we'll, it will certainly expand our market to have 
more uh, more high quality content coming from uh, in other languages. And you were a pioneer in China, at Yale. Right. In fact, in China, you were kind of like uh, there's like Elvis, and then you're above Elvis. <laughs> it's just, Not quite. Uh, it's the no, but uh, the the the, uh, the uh, level of enthusiasm about you and, and sort of your status is, is pretty remarkable in China. What's your view on? Both the future of China as it relates to education, but also Coursera's opportunity there yeah. and challenges. China's, China's having, of course, an explosion in uh, the ed tech sector. I mean, there are many, many companies, nearly all of them focused on early childhood through, to, through secondary school. I mean, only a small handful focused on higher ed. Um, so there's, there, there, it's clear there's, there's latent opportunity to, uh, in China, the, I mean, the, right now though it's really focused on I, everything's focused on getting your children into the best university you can. So that the, the, right. many many companies doing different versions of how to prepare young people for um, the competitive examinations to get you into university. Um, um, you know, much much bigger. Well, you know this better than I, but a much bigger market, way bigger than the what, what's happening in the U.S. in terms of dollar revenue. And, and uh, numbers of people involved. Um, it, the, it, it's, it's been a little tricky for Coursera in China so far because, um, because the, 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 you know, we, we, without a Chinese partner, you, you can't get inside the firewall and have really seamless um, um, you know, absence of latency in, your, in the transmission of your, of your uh, content. So we're not. It's it's the platform somewhat awkward to use and slow in China. But but and still we have you know two a couple million users. A couple but, million users yeah. and and five of the six top universities. universities. Yeah, but they don't. But they're not. They're, the universities don't don't get the life skills component there. They they're they're putting on courses that are really pitched to undergraduates, mm -hmm. and. It's understandable from China's perspective. They have a, the government, the Ministry of Education, has a very particular view of how online learning should be used, and it stems from recent Chinese history. What happened was, starting in 1998, the Chinese made a gigantic investment in expanding the capacity of the higher ed system, and so they went they went from 10 percent of the cohort going to college to 30 percent in a decade, right. which is yeah. Uh, you know, astounding, Stop, yeah. really. And th to do that, of course, they, they had to, they had to uh, create a lot of new universities, increase the enrollments in lots of others, and they ended up with uh, not enough teachers and not enough high-quality teachers in those institutions. So they wanted to use the top universities to, to do online content to help educate people at other universities. It's not gone that well. Uh, I mean, the government's not is not that happy with the outcome. Some schools in the hinterlands are using a lot of the content from Beida and Shanghai Chatham, by the way, on Chinese platforms in the Chinese language. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, but, but it's not been as successful as they hoped. And it's really been hard to get people focused on, you should be making, even our Chinese partners, you should be making courses for people in the workplace. Right. Um, so far, it hasn't quite failed. It will at some point. And, and I think the opportunity to do uh, corporate training in China is substantial. And I, I, I'm pretty confident that, that if we, if, at some point when we decide to focus on it at Coursera, that we will have a lot of opportunities since we're still acknowledged and recognized in China as having the best content, because we have the best global universities. So there's over $2 trillion spent on global education. And you're an economist by training. Yep. Um, you look at internet economics, where there's disproportionate gain to the leader in category or winner take most. Mm -hmm. Can that happen here? Why or why not? Or how do you think? You know, right now clearly Coursera is the leader with gigantic network effects and yeah. so forth. I mean, how do you see this playing out in terms of the size potential opportunity? Well, I think Coursera could be a very large company, but I don't think this is a winner take all or winner necessarily winner take most market because there's so it, the products are so highly differentiated uh, so it's not you know you think about the things that are winner take all or winner take most it's a standardized product I mean Facebook is the same for everybody around the world I mean the the, the 
the, the platform, it's, it's, one, it's one platform, one kind of interface, and people create their own, you know, if you will, content it's sort of, uh, on, on those, in the social media, media uh, platforms and so forth. So it's not, this is different, this is different in that there's, there's so many different types of education, um, so many different fields of education, so many different professional certifications, so many different jobs and occupations, that the idea that one company will gain a kind of monopoly advantage by having, by being able to offer all of them, kind of unlikely. I mean, it's a huge advantage to be the biggest, and we certainly will do our, our we're going to be doing our best to make sure we take advantage of that position by c continually expanding our product line, you know, so that we do go into adjacent areas, I, and, and uh, but, you know, covering the whole space is, is tricky, I think. And that two trillion, of course, includes K through 12 and early childhood and everything else. And the question is, will we really have the capacity to go there? I mean, I think for the medium term, I would say we, I would say smarter to stay with the adult market, but but move down the spill the, down the skill continuum to to more to lower skill and middle school jobs. And so I've got a couple more questions. So any questions from the um, audience? Um, I'll be looking for those in a second. But first, it's, uh, talk about AI, how it's going to disrupt jobs, and then contrast that with this concept of lifelong learning, and even one of the programs on Coursera, which is learning how to learn. Right. So how, I mean, how do you see that kind of tension, if you will, of technology replacing jobs, how learning is going to help basically create yep. skills for new jobs? Yep. Yep. And, and some of the things like learning how to learn, which is sort of a reality for this lifelong learning. Well, you're, you're one of the most effective spokesmen on this topic uh, that I've heard. But what did you say? I, you, you, you oh, are no. one of the most effective. <laughs> but, but, I, but I must say, I'm, uh, uh, I think we're in agreement on most of this. That, yeah. that first of all, um, the new technologies uh, related to AI are going to transform more jobs than they actually destroy. Uh, they will destroy some jobs, but you know, most of the estimates have, are, are in the neighborhood of, you know, maybe 15% of jobs get totally destroyed, but 60 or 70% of jobs get changed. Just like the introduction of the personal computer changed many jobs and, and destroyed some, but didn't destroy that many, you know. So, so it's more a question of how are we going to educate people in the skills uh, that are needed in, in, the, in, in the transformed set of jobs that are available. And by the way, some jobs are transformed uh, so that they're more dependent on, on automation. And that may actually downskill the job in some ways, in some cases. In some cases, it will upskill the job because you have to, you have, to have an intelligent interaction with the machines. Um, and, and then there's an entire set of jobs that are high-skilled jobs that are created in the sector that's producing the AI-enabled devices. So, so there's, if you want, if you think about this from a standpoint of a national competitive strategy, you want to do as much training as you can to get those new high-skilled jobs. And Chinese see this really clearly. And they, 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 they're focused on it. We don't, in the United States, don't have nearly a clear, you know, any kind of clear national strategy to deal with that. But I would say online learning can play a big role there. And that, that is actually the niche Coursera is in right now, which is training people for the higher level jobs that are going to be the machine learning programmers and developers. And, the, and, and uh, uh, I mean, that, where is the world getting its data scientists right now? Preponderantly from Coursera. Right. And, and so that, um, that's already happening. That's, uh, and this is why I also see them sort of Coursera attacking the sort of more middle skills dimension as important to give learners everywhere the capacity to, to cope with the jobs, the, the changing skill mix for ordinary middle class jobs. So I think that, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big project. Now, how does that interact with, um, as you said, with um, uh, the sort of habits of learning? Well, it's, it, it, it's true that um, that many people, you know, mid-career are just are just not that accustomed to going back to school, if you will, to learn new skills. And 
Coursera does have some great ways to help break that block by, the, and you mentioned our Learning How to Learn course, which is a terrific course for just about anyone, which gives you sort of insight into some of this, you know, what are the right study skills to, to be able to master content and, and some of the tricks that most people don't, don't realize mm -hmm. that can help them that can help them succeed in a learning task. And uh, so I'm sure that's the kind of content we'll want to develop even more of and maybe make more specific we related to different uh, types of jobs and occupations. So the degree. So obviously Coursera has, uh, has worked with universities to create degree programs. Right. And as you project you know, what this looks like five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, Coursera is going to have a lot of people that went through their platform to have degrees. Right. But do you think the degree is going to be as valuable in the future as it is today? And I think it's going to be more valuable? Or could it be potentially less valuable, valuable just because there's going to be other ways that people represent their capabilities, their skills? Credentials will enable a lot of people further down the road in their careers to advance themselves without the excessive expense of having to go back to school for a full-time degree program. So there, there, yes, it's true that, that, uh, that, that um, I mean, what, what you will see less of, I think, is people aged, let's say, 28 and above going back to school to get master's degrees. Um, and you'll see more of people doing alternative credentials and getting online master's degrees. The number of master's degree students in total will go up. Right. I believe yeah. the number of people getting online credentials will go credentials of less than a degree will go has already gone up tremendously and will go up even more dramatically in the future. So there'll just be a lot more ways to get yourself certified to advance your career. I think it's all complementary. I don't really see you know, I don't see um, the university sector suffering by this yeah. particularly. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Also, just the average. Age of a Coursera student is 35 years old. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, yeah. It really is this. Well, that, that's a, that's a, see, that's, this is when I say when I when I started out, we talked about what I'm most disappointed in. It's get getting the universities to actually get their arms around that idea that their job is not just teaching 18 to 22 year olds undergraduate courses, and you know, 22 to 30 year olds, you know, masters and PhD courses. But they, they can educate people throughout their life, which means the market is like vastly larger. And Significantly yeah, larger. Yeah. And you're right. You yeah. know, today, 75% of all students in universities are, quote, non traditional. Right. You know, not 18 to 24 years old, not you know, working right. all these right. you know, different aspects. And yet, universities are set up for 18 to 22 year olds classes Absolutely. during the day, marching band, football team, <laughs> dormitory, all relevant for you know, over half of their audience. Right. Um, do we have questions? So um, I, I'm sure we do. And, uh, great. So um, one is, <laughs> I, I'll ask this to you. Like that. So one question is, what is the Coursera's biggest challenge going forward, in your view? The biggest, well, I talked about a couple of challenges, uh, but I think, um, I, I think, I, I think the, um, if I had to weigh all of the challenges, I, I still think getting the product to be better and better is the biggest challenge. I mean, just being figuring out clever and creative ways to make the online learning experience as rich and as helpful to students as it possibly can be. I mean, already online learning has certain superior dimensions. For example, just the rewind button is helpful because if you're sitting in a lecture, yeah. you you get confused, you you're lost for an hour, but uh, the, re the rewind button does allow you to go back and play it over if you're confused. Um, but we're starting to use AI to, 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 um, to help give learners hints as they progress through courses. When we now have enough data to be able to tell people in some of our more popular courses, we're seeing a pattern here. You're, you're in trouble for the next assessment because people who look, who's whose pattern looks like yours up to now you know, some large percentage actually fail this next assessment. Here's what you need to do to prepare yourself. Go back and look at this video segment. So we're actually doing that now in a handful of courses, trying to trying to use the data to, to make that work. I mean, 
more things like that that really aid the learner's journey, I think, where people come away from the experience thinking, they're, they're, you know, I, could, I couldn't have mastered this content without, course, without Coursera's help. Yeah. You know, um, I think that, that's a huge, it's a huge technical challenge for Coursera to solve that. Um, but I think it's is immensely valuable and will make the, our consumers far more loyal. So um, this is a, a, a question that, because you're a sophisticated financial person, I'm going to ask it, and you don't have to answer it, <laughs> and I might jump in. It says, please discuss how you value Coursera, especially from the last round of this one. Do you have any comments on that? Well, the, uh, the metrics have all kept pace. That is, the, so, I mean, you, you're, you're, you may be better at that, but, the, you know, um, when we, uh, the last round was the, was 750 free money. This one is about a billion and a half free money. Right. But so more or less doubled. The, the revenue is um, actually about tripled in right. that time. So, so there's a, there's a start. <laughs> well, what I'd say is exactly that. Yeah. I mean, it's been basically, the valuation actually isn't quite gone as fast as the revenue has grown, yeah. which over time, you know, how the business does and how the, how the value grows right. will be cor highly correlated. Yeah. I'd say also when you look at comparables in the marketplace, um, institutional investors understand uh, how important education <coughs> is in the knowledge economy. And you've seen companies like Pluralsight, right. which is focused on technology training. And by the way, with a linear model, not a network effect model, that's, that's being valued over 18 times sales. Chegg, which is providing student resources in online, uh, online ways, is valued at about 14 times sales. So of course, Sarah has had the same um, value metrics applied to it. it the valuation would actually be quite a bit higher than the last, than the round that was just completed. Yeah. So anyway, I think ultimately, um, you know, ultimately it's going to be the, the growth that drives the value. But I think we're, you know, we're well positioned. Oh, absolutely. I think that, that you know, uh, the company, even at, even at 10 times revenue, you know, three years from now, people are going to have done really well, yeah. investors. <laughs> exactly. Well, with that, um, can't thank you enough. It was a really fun yeah. conversation. Hopefully... Uh, our audience got to, to learn more about the insights into both Coursera and the education market from somebody who knows it better than anybody. And we just greatly appreciate your um, being part of this today. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. Okay, right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Goodbye. All right. Good. Awesome.